Without further ado, I want to welcome um, Vicki, Tim, and Emil from the Boulder County Parks and Rec Open Space. Tom, I'm sorry, but you This is Tom. I apologize. We'll, we'll, we'll do that again so you can figure out who's who. That's a great thing. Okay, I just got it wrong. I'm going to stand over here. I'm Mike. Can you hear me? Is that working okay? I'm fuzzy. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, Do you want me to turn the volume down? I don't know that I have a button that does that. This is not my setup. Um, okay. Well, Penny will let Penny work that back there. She's got us all mic'd for this. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to see all you people. This is fabulous. We don't normally get, you know, crowds quite this large because we don't generally have a library that's working as well as this one is at putting out programs and getting people to sign up for them. That's just fabulous. I'm Vicki Brown Eagle, uh, and this is Tom Manwary. This is Emil Leonard, and we are volunteer naturalists with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. So we're here tonight because we're not experts, but we do have a real love of and interest in birding. So I'm just really excited to see all you folks here. How many of you are birders? Yay. How many of you just have a, maybe have a feeder once in a while? Put out a feeder in the winter for the birds. All right. How many of you are here because you want to learn about birds? What are here? Perfect. All right, well, we've got a couple of things in the back that uh, on the side out here I want to make sure that you're aware of. The first is, this is the County Images magazine. It comes out quarterly. You can uh, sign up to have it mailed to your house. You can get it online. Um, and we pass them out at all of our programs. And in it is a listing of every program the county's offering for that quarter. So this is spring. So through May, it talks about all the programs we're doing like this, that if we're in the libraries, we're starting to do our hikes. We do senior hikes up at the county uh, properties. We do kids programs. If you have kids or grandkids, you want to get them signed up for some stuff. We have some great programs for those. Um, so this is something that it's a great resource that's available to you for free from Boulder County uh, Parks and Open Space. So I encourage you to pick one up and sign up for it. You want to trade up? <coughs> mic check, hold on. Is it on? Yeah. Is it mic check, mic check? No. 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 <laughs> Hello? 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 Oh. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'll try to hold it up here so you can hear me. If you can't hear me in the back, just raise your arms back there and, and we'll try to talk louder and I'll try to hold it up. The other thing I want to tell you about is that we also brought you copies of a map to your county parks. So this has a map that tells you where all the county parks are that are available and then what kinds of activities go on in those parks. Which ones have biking, which ones have hiking, uh, and which other have fishing, some of those things. So be, feel free to pick that up as well, and it has a map showing you where things are. And lastly, this is a program evaluation, and we would love for you to pick it up, comment anything you like. We'd like to improve these programs. If they're too long, if they're too nerdy, if they're not nerdy enough, uh, let us know and we'll work on that. So you can fill this out, you can leave them here, you can drop them in the mailbox. Postage is already paid. Okay, anything else we should cover before we... All right. Um, I'd just like to say that so some of you are orders, but some of you just don't hear this. We have a number of books, guide, field guides here that are, some of them are just for Colorado, some are just other really useful books that that we found that we like to use when we're birding. Uh, and I've got a 
handout here of a few local birding organizations who have walks at a lot of the same Boulder County parks, but go other places as well. So there are different resources that you can um, you can have access to on the web that just allow you to learn as, as much or as little as you would like about about local birds. So if you'd like to talk more about that at the end of the presentation at that time, um, we're happy to talk more about that, although it's not part of our program. Good. Yeah, uh, and we'll put together that list of resources and have there are a few handouts here. Um, but if you, you want one and you don't get it, let one of us know and we'll make sure we get to your copy. Um, but it's just additional resources for those. Because you know when we're done here, you're all going to want to run out and start birding. <laughs> so we want to make sure you have the resources to do that. Not in my spot. <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, this is a general program about birding through Boulder County. It's kind of an introductory program on what birds are in Boulder County, where might you find them, kind of what do they look like, what's something interesting about them so that you'll want to go find them. But it's a ge very generalist kind of program. So we're going to kind of work through it. Um, and when we're done, if there are questions, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, and so if you have something, just remember it, try to remember it, and we'll move along. So this is spring. We are doing this by seasons. So you'll kind of get a sense of what's here when. And this is the perfect time to start because we're all at this point looking forward to spring, <laughs> even though it looks like maybe we're going to get a little more snow. Um, and there's nothing that says spring to me. Oops, let me move back. Sorry. There's nothing that says spring to me like the sound of the meadow lark. Uh, somebody said the meadow lark whistles in spring, and I just think that's that's a very poetic way to put it, and pretty accurate. Uh, if you have this is a grassland bird. Uh, I happen to live out uh, east of Longmont, uh, and I back up to some ag land, and so I get to hear that this time of year. Uh, and when we first moved out there, there was not a lot of development, and there were a lot more of them, but they nest on the ground, and they're pretty good at hiding those nests, but when people move in with cats, particularly, and let them roam at night, um, they're and they tend to, to leave because their babies are being predated on. Um, but the western meadowlark is one you can go look for right now and particularly listen for. Great horned owls. Any of you hear great horns at night? Hear them now? The great horned owl is one of the most common owls in North America. It's certainly our most common owl in Boulder County. Uh, and it's a very early nester. They nest in cavities or in tree in nests that have been made by other species because they can't make their own because their bills are not adapted for making nests. So they are um, the in their nests now, sitting there nests, and they'll be, they they're going to be starting to. Uh, feed their young pretty quickly because they're starting to hatch them now and they'll be on them, on their feeding them until about April. Now the young will come out of the nest uh, and be fledged and they'll look like this. <laughs> really fluffy because they still have that down and they don't have flight feathers. But they, they walk up and down the branches doing what this one is doing until they begin to, to get flight feathers and start exercising. So during that entire period, both adults will be feeding those young, coming and going all the time. Um, there used to be a really good nest that you could see at Twin Lakes in Boulder. Um, and it was in a, a tree cavity right along the trail. Um, they don't seem to be in that tree cabin anymore. Somebody told me they're still out there somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Uh, but uh, they are really fun to watch. There is a nest currently uh, along 75th and just west of Nelson, uh, behind along that, that the 
riparian area there where there are a bunch of big cottonwood trees. One of them <coughs> has a now in there. The male is smaller than the female, but he has the deeper voice. So when you hear them going, woo, woo, he's the one with the deep voice, but he's the smaller prey. Um, many of the raptors and owls, in fact, almost all of them show this difference in um, their sizing, where the female is the larger and sometimes more aggressive of the species. Nobody's quite sure why, except it may give them a additional prey base with the different sizes, and she's usually on the nest and has to protect it. So she's a bigger, larger bird. <coughs> The um, robins used to be the harbinger of spring, but they're here all the time now. And um, they are, uh, you see them in your yard in the winter, but right now you're seeing them gathering up under the trees looking for food. Um, they do migrate to some degree, but so the one you have all winter may actually head a little further north in the summer. And the Canada geese, you know, before humans came to this part, well, humans, before agricultural people came out here and started developing their resources for agriculture, Canada geese just flew right on by. So you would only see them overhead. Now we have reservoirs and canals and we have um, all those wonderful golf courses and green lawns. And the geese not only come, they stay. And they don't migrate at all anymore. We get a lot of songbirds that come in that don't winter with us, but migrate back in either on their way further north or like the lazuli bunting to nest up in a little bit further up in the elevations. So if you're familiar with uh, Pile Valley Ranch up on the 36, that's a great place to go look for these. The male, they come in looking, they molt along the migration up from Central America, Mexico, and they look, oops, I keep doing that. They look like this as they begin their route. But by the time they get here, the males look like this. They're just lovely birds, and they sit on the tops of uh, some of the, the shrubs and sing. They like shrubby, brushy areas along the trails, uh, so that's a good place to go look for these guys. Um, I pronounce them lazuli bunting. Others can pronounce them lazuli. I don't think it makes any difference, but they are named after the beautiful lazuli lapis. So, When the birds get here, they can occasionally be overtaken by our spring storms that come in. And that leaves them with uh, a predicament where they may not have sufficient food resources to get through that bad storm. So that's why bird feeders, particularly in the early spring, are really useful for the birds. Uh, so if you want to put up a bird uh, feeder, this is a good time of year to do that. Um, they just tell us to be careful with um, getting them, keeping them clean. If you get the water, make sure you keep the water clean. So we don't want to spread disease, we just want to feed them. <coughs> it's also a great way to put a feeder out and then you can bird in the winter from inside your house. <laughs> These are two of the birds you'll see in your yard all year round. The house finch, Look, the males will not look as red, the females have almost none, and the goldfinches in the winter look like this, even the males. <coughs> but at this time of year, the males are moving into their beautiful spring finery because all the birds at this point are looking for nests and mates and love and time to raise babies. So this is when they're molting into that spring plumage. And you can get American goldfinches at your feeders. They like niger seed. And uh, you can get them out there this time of year. And you can see them come in in those beautiful colors. <coughs> These are the bluebirds. 
Um, these are the mountain bluebirds. Has anybody seen mountain bluebirds here yet, back yet? They're starting to come back. Um, I tend to, they come through this sort of elevation on their way up to a little bit further. Uh, and if you get, if you go up, I used to do uh, uh, bluebird monitoring uh, in the uh, boxes that Audubon and uh, the county put out on properties, on county properties. And they nest up at Howe Valley Ranch, up at Walker Ranch. Uh, they may even be at Hall, I'm not sure. Um, I tend to see them most often at Rocky Mountain National Park this time of year. I saw a pretty large group at Rabbit Mountain. At Rabbit Mountain, that would be a good spot too. They like to move up into those elevations. And like the western bluebirds, they will nest in boxes, but they need um, they need to nest on the edge of forests because they want to nest where there are some protection for them and their young, but they want to have an open field out in front of them to go look for insects and bugs. So that's their favorite place to nest. And as those areas become less available because they're being developed, it's really important that the county maintain those open spaces so that they have a place to nest. And that's why the boxes are put up to help them and monitor those to keep them going. These are the western bluebirds, and they're very uh, happy to nest at the top of the edge. We get a lot of bar barbers when coming through this time of year that we won't see the rest of the year. Beautiful colored warblers coming up, uh, moving up to either higher elevations or further north. Um, the uh, And you'll see, these are just a few of the ones you'll see. So go out and look for those up in the trees right now because it's a good time to look for those. The yellow-breasted chat is still considered a warbler. It's the largest warbler, but people are looking at whether it actually should be a warbler. It's much larger than any of the rest. Um, and a good place to see that is like Hall Ranch, uh, Rabbit Mountain, um, places like that. And if you hear a bird singing and it goes on and on and on and has all different kinds of calls, and one of them sounds like a dog whistle, <laughs> you may be hearing a chat. I think that's why they call them chats. The other one that I see all the time at Walden Pond is the yellow warbler. This one right here. And the male has red streaks on the front, the female doesn't. But they're up in the trees, they're singing, and if you walk any of the trails at Walden Pond, you'll almost always see yellow warblers through the spring and the summer. And hear them. The osprey are back. Yeah. Um, Osprey were one of the species that were almost wiped out by the DDT in the 60s. Uh, but they have made a great resurgence, and in part because they're very tolerant of these human-built nesting platforms, and they will nest on them. Um, and they, uh, there's one at Lagerman, there's one at the county fairgrounds, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's one out at 9th, on 9th Street in Longmont, by the, the uh, golf course, right there by the railroad track as you drive by, and there are osprey on each one of those right now. Um, then there's one out at, uh, there are some at St. Brain State Park on the way out to I-25, and they're starting uh, to nest uh, on one of the platforms. Um, they, uh, there is a nest webcam the county maintains. Has any of you seen that one? Um, and it's a live camera that is focused on the nest that is at the Boulder County Fairgrounds, on Cattail Ponds, sort of on that east side of the fairgrounds behind where the farmer's market is. There's a big platform there with a nest, and uh, they successfully nested on that for the last, I don't know, five or 10 years. Um, and they're both, both male and female are back now. And if you just want to see them live at any time, um, just Google Boulder County Osprey camera or cam, and it should pop up, and you should be able to see. In fact, there was an article in the Longmont Times Call last week about the this Osprey uh, platform and the camera uh, that's available, and you can watch it. Uh, they were called uh, used to be called the uh, fish 
hawks, because that is their favorite food, and that's what they need when they go. Um, this is duck season, believe it or not. It's spring, the ducks are here, and they are in their breeding finery. Um, and they are out there in those ponds coming in now. They'll be there March, April is a good time to go look at any of the ponds, uh, Walden Pond or any of the others that are out there. Um, and this one, this wood duck, I was told its Latin name means waterfowl in wedding dress. <laughs> I think it's pretty appropriate. Um, it's, it's the most gorgeous duck you'll ever see. This, of course, is the male. Um, these white-faced ibis, they come in, in in groups, and they're here for a couple of days, and then they're moving on. So you're lucky if you get to see them. And you can go out and feed. There'll be 30 of them out at Walton Pond. You go back the next day, there's not a one. So take your chances. Uh, the, the, the western breed do nest. Uh, in the county, they tend to nest in the reeds. They nesting at Union Reservoir, up against the the uh, northern that northern reed area. So look for them. They're the ones that you'll see with the black crown on the head. There's a lot of them. Around. And if the water is shallow enough for the waders to get their bills down and pull up all those yummy succulent things they like that tend to squirm and. Uh, or insects, uh, then you will find these waders. Uh, the Abisset, uh, in fact, I think every single one of these pictures was taken at Walden Pond. Um, the Abisset is in breeding plumage. Uh, in uh, They're out there, they're starting out there now. The uh, killdeer are always there, and they they're the ones that nest on the ground and then will pretend they have a broken uh, wing if somebody gets too close to try to lure the, the uh, predator away with their broken wing while they're screaming. Um, the phalarope, this phalarope is the female because this is one of the few bird species where the female is all dressed in finery because she's going to come to the nest that the male has built. She's going to lay her eggs and she's going to say, see ya. And they're gonna, and she may come back once in a while just to make sure that he's feeding them. And he's gonna raise, he's gonna sip them and raise that nest. So he's the dull drab one, and she's all dressed up. All of these birds can be found in the bottom too. Yep. I, I, I yep. Really yep. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, right now they're out in all the ponds. This is a great time to start thinking about birding because spring. I mean, who doesn't want to get outside when the weather's nice in the spring? And you can go out and you can see these beautiful birds. It helps if you have a pair of binoculars, but they don't have to be expensive and maybe you can borrow some. Um, these, of course, are the, the blackbirds. And they're, they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. The, um, the red-winged blackbird is the one you hear in the, the reeds and the males calling and he's doing a, a, a sound that says to you, says to the females, I've got a, I own this territory, and you can build your nest here, because she's going to build a nest. And, he, and the yellow-headed blackbird is larger, more aggressive, so if he's also out there in that marsh, <coughs> he's going to get the best nesting areas, best territory. Both of these are going to have harems. So if he has a good territory, he invites her to come in, she comes and builds her nest. The, uh, the yellow headed always builds it hanging out over the waters. Uh, the red wing down inside the reeds. But they're going to have a number of nests that they are going to father. Now, they're not necessarily going to feed them all, but they're going to father all the ones that they think. But what they now know is that <coughs> she's not monogamous. <laughs> and so as soon as he's not defending that particular part of the territory, she's also inviting in a few other names. <laughs> Broad-tailed hummingbirds, they only exist in North America. They were not known in the old world at all. Um, they don't winter here, so this is a good time. You will see them coming up from Central America, uh, Mexico, our primary one is the broad-tailed hummingbird. The male has a really 
strong red uh, throat underneath, and he makes a, a high-pitched uh, whine when he flies. It's made by his feathers. Um, and they love your feeders. Now, this time of year, I don't get them very much because they're moving up into the uh, higher elevations for breeding. And they'll breed all the way up to 10,000 feet. Here. But um, I get them in the fall when they're moving back down. And so if you have feeders, now's a good time because they're coming through. The ADN April, they'll be coming through. Um, and occasionally, as this photo points out, they have to share the feeders with others who <coughs> happen to want to whatever they can get of that sweet, sugary food. The hummingbird needs to, because it flies so fast, you know, its wings are going so fast, its heart rate's going so fast, it's moving all the time, it needs to consume about the equivalent of what a, a normal adult would have of about 300 hamburgers a day. Wow. <laughs> so it'll, it'll take your nectar, it'll give it to um, Woodpeckers. Any of you have flickers? who are uh, banging on your house or <laughs> on your, the side or on your drain pipes. They're just looking for love too. But um, and they want to know if, if there's any but any female out there, can she hear them? Um, the preference is for them to go build their nest cavity in a tree. <laughs> which they do and as do the other woodpeckers. And they're very good at excavating out um, holes in the, the dead wood or the cavity of the tree which then other small birds can use later as well. Um, the, we have both the hairy and, you can't read this at top very well, but this is the downy woodpecker. And this is simply the hairy. It looks just like it, but it's bigger. And the prime, and they're hard to tell apart. Uh, but the primary difference is that the hairy bill is about twice as long as the downy. This is the one you generally see in your feet. This one you see a little bit higher up in the, I see it at least a little higher up in the mountains, um, outside of Lyons, it's been like outside Grand Canyon. Sap suckers come through and they breed higher up, so we don't generally see too many of them at this elevation, but they are the ones that drill holes, and you can hear them, they just go, they make like a and they're drilling little holes all along because they have small tongues and they like to pull and out <coughs> and lick up the um, sap. So, uh, and these you can see again at a slightly higher elevation. Flycatchers, very handy to have around because they love insects. And they're fun to watch because if you've ever seen one sitting on a pole or on a line or a wire or a stick, and then all of a sudden what it does is it flies out, grabs an insect in midair, and flies back to another perch and eats it. And it might be a mosquito, it might be a moth, but they'll do it by the hundreds. So you actually like having these around. They're, they're sometimes hard to tell apart, so I'm not going to tell you that you have to even figure that out. Just know that if it's sitting on a, on a perch and flies out, grabs something and flies back, it's probably a black <laughs> so most of these are a little higher in elevation, but you can see the, these say species. You can see the say species um, all in where there are water in the banks of the wall and in those areas. And the swallows. The swallows, we have um, actually we have five different swallows in the wall, and some days you can see them all. The, uh, the tree swallows uh, nest out there. The violet green nests a little higher in elevation. The barn swallow, this was taken at Union Reservoir. They like to build up under the eaves. They're the ones you see with that up in there, there. And if you're not careful, they'll get you. <coughs> but you want those as well because they like to eat the Miller moths. They're the ones you see. You stop at a stoplight, and all the Miller moths come out from under your car in the spring. And suddenly, there's a swarm of birds going around. <coughs> We have birds that come out to the plains, the grasslands, um, different kinds of sparrows uh, that, are, that like to again eat insects and go on plains uh, and go out anywhere out further out to east and see these. The hermit thrush 
It was generally a secret of bird that nests further up, but it has this gorgeous song. <coughs> it's actually using both sides of its throat to make what sounds like a double song <coughs> and harmonizing with itself. <laughs> um, then again, in the spring, we get uh, a, this is, as I say, the time to go look because some of these birds will stay and some won't. Uh, most of these will all stay. The Swainson's hawk comes in about the middle of April, and you'll start seeing it coming in and nesting up uh, in uh, building nests. So that's one off the 75th down from Wall, and then like 75th and then Rappahoe usually comes back into that. The Western Tanager, as beautiful as this male is, Go look for it now because as soon as the leaves come out, you just can't see it. <coughs> the canyon ran Rabbit Mountain, particularly just sort of dusk. Listen for the do 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 That's the canyon ran. <laughs> so what's that? This <laughs> 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 dinner. <laughs> okay. Yep, those are the wild turkeys. That's the male looking again for a mate uh, and strutting around uh, trying to gather up his harem. Um, <coughs> if you go up to, I've never been to Ohio Valley Ranch where I can hear and usually see a group of these. Uh, they are at Sandstone Ranch. They're just out in the general areas uh, around in the county and, uh, and usually in large numbers. <laughs> and we have birds of all different kinds. These are seed eaters, uh, the ghost beaks. And I like this because I want you to tell, I want to tell you just a couple of things. This is the black-headed ghost beak. We have a couple of them. The dad takes care of the nest and the feeding of the young about half the time. He takes about half the responsibility for raising that brood. I think he's a very admirable person. <laughs> um, and the second thing is, you have to look at these babies. Now, scientists say that birds are the living descendants of the dinosaurs. What do you think? <laughs> Which, so I think this says the case. Toadies, you'll see them, they nest on the ground. Hall Ranch, Great place to go by the toadies, as well as the orioles. Uh, they nest up there as well. I was up there one June, and they were flying in and out of the parking lot with nesting materials. So uh, it's a good place to go watch the uh, the orioles. And again, they they're weavers, so they weave these very elaborate nests right in here, and you can see them right now. As soon as it leaps out, you won't. But unfortunately, that's last year's nest, and they're probably not going to use it again. Um, the male is very striking, and um, and again, if you wait till the leaves come out, hard to find. <coughs> they're also at Walden Pond. They're around in most of the, the county areas. And then the house reds, they'll nest very happily in your boxes if you have a nest box at your house. And what I like to do is watch them the, try to build their nest in the box. And they work so hard to get that long stick in the nest. And quite frequently they do. Um, and this male is going to build a nest. And he's going to probably go build another nest. And then he's going to invite the female to take her pick. So he's a very cunning guy. <laughs> Um, a couple of other small birds that you see around are the kinglets and the warblers. But this one is primarily to talk about the brown-headed cowbirds. The brown-headed cowbirds originally used to follow the bison around out on the plains. And because they had to follow the bison, they never had a place to sort of nest and leave and stay. So they took up a, a trait called parasitization where they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. 
and let the other birds raise their babies. Now, sometimes the other birds uh, get wise to this and roll them out, but sometimes they don't, and or their own and their own babies will suffer because this is the yellow warbler feeding this enormous. <laughs> She's not going to have much food left for her own brood. So they actually are, are pretty hard on the uh, successful breeding of the birds whose nests they parasitize. Parasitize. And then we get birds that are moving in that haven't been here before. And so we have the great tailed grackles coming up from Texas. They're now here uh, most summers. The Eurasian collared doves, they actually were brought to the Bahamas flew up to Florida, and they are everywhere in the United States now. And then if you find any of these down here, <laughs> would you call me? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. We'll talk some. Can everybody hear me if I use my big voice? Yes. Yes. All right. Vicki and Tom have been at this naturalist thing for a while. I think more than a year. I've been a naturalist for Two weeks. That's what today. So you are my first group, but I'm looking forward to uh, to talking about summer. So by the time we get to summer, first of July, the migration activities gone. Birds that are going from further south all the way up to Arctic are gone, and they've moved on their way. So the birds that we see here during the summer are essentially breeding here. They're they're nesting, they're raising their young, and so summer is really about it's really about Parents raising their young and trying to make sure that they survive, um, finding enough food, making sure that there's not much they can do out the weather. But that's um, predation is a is a real phenomenon. Um, sometimes that's from other birds. Sometimes it's from other causes, from other kinds of predators. But really, summer the birds you see here in summer are either year-round residents who are breeding or they're migrating and the climate is right for them to breed. Sometimes they're breeding, as you said, from higher altitudes. Uh, but anyway, birds you see here in the summer are, are, are breeding and raising their young. Okay? Um, let's first talk about songbirds. So most songbirds, monogamous, single, single pair. Uh, both parents typically care for the young. It takes about three weeks for for bird, for young newly newly hatched birds to, to grow to the point where they can leave the nest. But in those first few days, they're blind, they're featherless, um, and they're very weak. So they're really counting on the supply of food from their parents, um, and hopefully that nest is in a place where they're well protected and well camouflaged, and that the weather is good during that critical period of time. Um, they are eating voraciously. Um, Young Robin's probably eating a dozen earthworms a day. One would be enough for me, I think. But um, you know, so, and so all of that is growing is going into their really, really rapid growth. And at the end of that that three week period of time, they're essentially fully they're the same size as adults, and they've gotten a, a set of, of feathers that will allow them to survive. Um, you will. You know, juvenile birds, as I said, leave the nest after about three weeks and they're almost full size. And parents continue to feed them um, until they're convinced they can, they can fend for themselves. Um, you'll often, you can, you can see, uh, you can see uh, young robins especially because they're out in the open sometimes. They look a little bit more ragged. Their, their feathers are not quite as well. But they look like a full-grown bird, and they're yammering and calling and waiting for the parents to feed them. And it's obvious that they're, uh, they're, they're fully able to, to, to fend for themselves. But I guess like teenagers or you know, young adults, they would rather be taken care of than have to fend for themselves. Um, so the next task then is for, the, for those birds to, be, to get their feathers under them and be able to, to learn um, learn to fly. Okay. Um, we talked. We'll talk a little bit about predators. Um, 
life for young birds is pretty difficult. In a year when the weather is good and there are no dangerous spring snowstorms, probably only 50% of songbirds that hatch survive their first year. Uh, and some years the, the mortality rate is much, much higher. Um, strangely enough, house cats are one of the, the most effective predators. All of you guys who have cats have probably gotten plenty of gifts delivered to your doorstep, a head of a mouse or a pile of feathers. Birds in the United States, house cats, domestic cats, kill somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion and a half songbirds a year. Okay. A billion and a half. So um, if it's all the same, if you have a cat and you enjoy that cat, but you also enjoy your feeder, leave the cat inside because they can be a very, very effective predators. Not just with fledglings and young birds, but with adult birds as well. <coughs> um, let me talk a little bit about about jays. Jays are also predators. Mostly they're insect eaters, but jays as a group, and there are several species that we have here, are pretty opportunistic. So while they're interested mostly in insects, if they find small rodents or they find eggs or they find nests or small fledglings uh, and they're hungry, they will take care of that. Um, blue jays are a species of jay that we see in, uh, in the plains. Um, riparian areas, anywhere along a creek, you'll see them in the trees often calling. Um, stellar jays and scrub jays are present here in Colorado, usually at somewhat higher elevations. So if you're getting up into the foothills or up into the mountains during the summer, you will often um, run into scrub jays and stellar jays. Um, but these birds are also pretty effective predators. So something else for some birds to, um, to keep an eye out for. Um, if you get even higher elevations, there are also um, birds like Clark's Nutcracker um, and Gray Jays that live in higher elevations. And these birds, um, during the late summer and fall, start to collect seeds and acorns and other sources of food. They cache those. And a Clark's Nutcracker or a Jay may have accumulated Know, tens of thousands of seeds and, and acorns, pine seeds, pine nuts, or, or acorns, and they seem to have a pretty good sense of where those where those are and use that cash to survive throughout the winter. Um, but they don't always eat those. Everyone knows that some of those are lost, and a lot of the trees that end up growing in our forests in Boulder County are actually coming from from acorns that and, and seeds that those jays have cached and, and uh, forgotten about or didn't need to eat during the course of the winter. Black-billed magpies are also birds that are part of the jay family, although they look quite a bit different. Um, I think the thing that's the most interesting about them is that they build a very elaborate nest. It can take them several weeks to finish this. They build a whole Dome. It's got not just a. It's not just a bowl, but it's they've got a. They build a roof, yeah. so so they're uh, designed to help withstand the effects of weather, help better improve camouflage, and, and also um, you know fend off predators. So what you see that, that big bowl of brush up there is uh, is an magpie nest. Um, Vicky talked a little bit about northern flickers. These are some of my favorite birds. Um, they do nest in tree cavities. Um, one good spot that's nearby to see, to easily see nesting um, flickers is on the pathway between Rogers Grove Park and, Wal and uh, Golden Ponds. If you walk on the south side of the creek, there's some dead trees on the south side of that and there were three or four flickers that I saw earlier this week. Um, the males have the red mustache. The females look very much, the same. they look very much the same without that mustache. And although they are woodpeckers and they will, you'll hear them drumming and, and eating once, what they really love and subsist on for the most part during the summer are ants. So you will often see them, and they're just consuming thousands and thousands of ants. That's their primary primary food during the course of the summer. 
Ah, kestrels. Um, this is our smallest member of the falcon family um, here throughout the year. Um, these are the birds that you will often see on the wires along Highway 52 or along 95th Street there. They're just hanging out on the open wires looking out at the prairie. Um, a lot of the, the, those two black stripes are probably the thing that's most easily seen if you're just driving down the road and you notice them. Um, they like to pump their pump their tails frequently. Uh, it's just kind of a reflex action. The females and the males look a little bit different. Um, the male has blue primary feathers, whereas the, the female is more more reddish. Um, they're cavity nesters. Um, I was out at Stearns Lake just uh, about a week ago, and there's just north of the lake. There's this house that's been abandoned and surrounded by a big pile of dirt, but Kestrels had made a, a hole in the side of the wall and gotten into that house. And saw them going in there and, and nesting in there. Um, but they're obviously very effective predators, um, rodents for the most part, but not averse to taking birds. So you know you may end up seeing them at their feeders if, if they've learned that that's a good source of uh, Food, you'll, you'll often see them at, um, at feeders or, or near feeders or sitting on your fence post or on a wire nearby your house. Um, Bodtail hummingbirds. Uh, Vicki talked a little bit about this. Um, they're here during the summer. I think here you get a, another chance to see how the bright red uh, chin feathers that the male has. Um, trying to show off and prove his attractiveness. The female who's sitting on the nest over there with a couple of her chicks is much more nondescript, so that she can blend in and not be as as um, as, as prominent a target. Um, I've seen a uh, large number of these. They all they always have feeders at El Dorado State Park um, near the near one of the trailheads or the main parking area and. Sometimes you'll see 10 or 12 or 15. <laughs> and they're kind of, a, kind of a combination of sometimes it's breeding behavior, sometimes it's um, two males competing. But they've got some of this, every species has kind of a unique pattern. Um, but they'll see them charge up into the sky at 100 feet and then straight back down and, and buzzing all around. Um, the, the behavior of, of Hummingbirds, when you get them in close quarters around a feeder, it's really pretty remarkable, and they can be very aggressive with one another. Um, great blue herons. We were talking, I was talking about about herons with um, this woman here, and she had so two places where we have heronries, where the birds nest in the in the in the high reaches of of cottonwood trees. Um, we have pretty large heronries in the southwest corner of Walden Ponds, go all the way to the back. And I had just made it all the way out to the far southwest corner of Pella Crossing on the, on the west side of 75th Street and found a wonderful heronry back there where I found 18 or 20 birds. Um, now that they're nesting, now all those adults are hanging out around the perimeter of the marshes trying to find breakfast for lunch. Um, these birds are obviously much bigger, and for a heron to get to full size, it's going to take more than three weeks. So parents have a much uh, a much lengthier period of time that they've got to they've got to feed and protect and support their their chicks. Uh, typically, it's going to take them two or three months to raise their chicks to a uh, point where they can fledge and, and leave the nest. Belted kingfishers, one of my favorite birds. These birds have a wonderful raspy call. Um, they're where you will you will see them often perching on around the edge of a lake or along um, along a creek. Uh, branches that are sticking out over the edge of the lake, they'll be perched there. Um, and then they're diving into the water um, with that large beak and catching fish. Um, they typically nest by building uh, a cavity in a in a bank uh, of a creek. Um, just at Rogers Park earlier this week, I 
if you get off the cement path and you take one of the social trails closer to the creek, you, some of the new banks that have been exposed since the flood are prime areas for, for kingfisher nesting as well as some um, species of swallows, bank swallows. Um, and then I saw one that, it, that built a burrow and was heading into its nest there. Um, they also will take the time to teach their children, to teach their, their young how to fish. So they'll go find a fish, drop it in the water, and encourage their, and encourage their young to, to learn um, how to find their own food in that manner. Um, but these are wonderful, wonderful birds. Their call is very distinctive. Um, they're pretty active, and if you see a kind of a, 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 a deep, raspy call uh, along the edge of a lake, um, it's almost certainly a kingfisher. Um, white pelicans, huge bird, um, probably somewhat larger in wingspan than a, even a golden eagle. Maybe not as quite as massive, um, but um, these birds are often seen at very, very high altitude, soaring above us. Um, their their wing pattern is quite distinctive. Um, eagles are much much darker. Vultures have exactly the opposite color pattern, um, but you'll see them soaring in large groups, like the thermals, or in a pond. They're often in Walden. Um, they're often at Union Reservoir, uh, they're often at Boulder Reservoir, and um, you know, they're, they're here for the, here for the uh, summer night to rest. What, I don't really know exactly what purpose this, this serves, but um, both the males and the females during the breeding season develop this little protrusion uh, that comes out of their beak, and it's part of, part of their Part of their adaptation for their breeding behavior. Um, once breeding season is over, that that protrusion falls off and, and, and lose, uh, they lose that. But um, these are are beautiful birds and very very graceful. Yeah. Mallards are one of the few species of duck that stay throughout the the, the, the summer. Um, most ducks are here throughout the winter and they're starting to make their their way northward um, mallards are one of those species like uh, canadian geese and some of the other things where, we, where their their range has expanded and their their need to migrate um, has changed a little bit so these are the most commonly seen um, ducks during the course of the summer um, this Male, as I'm sure you've all seen, is the drake is quite distinctive with this with this bright, bright green head, um, and they don't spend very much time in the nest. Unlike songbirds, who are in the nest uh, and spending three weeks, or in the case of parents, spending months, um, a few days after they're hatched, they're out on the water and pulling their mothers around. You'll see the same kind of behavior with Canadian geese that that breed here as well. Um, They've got a kind of a different set of, of, of predatory things they're going to worry about. They've got to worry about um, minks. We have minks in, in all the ponds. You see them taking birds. Uh, one of the things that I, I didn't realize is that snapping turtles will sometimes find a, a, a duckling that's swimming ahead of its mother and take them from below. So a different set of predatory risks for for ducklings, um, and they've got uh, a difficult time to make it to, to adulthood. Okay. Raccoons, also another, um, they're happy to eat whatever they can, they're pretty opportunistic, so <coughs> that's uh, eggs or young, young fledglings, they're, they're happy to make a meal of them as well. And then uh, turkey vultures, um, these are another common bird during the summer. Um, they're not a raptor, so they're not part of the hawk or the eagle family. Uh, vultures are distinct, um, and they're kind of our our, um, our our garbage collectors. So they're the ones who are eating the roadkill, the carrion. Um, these birds migrate long distances. Um, they spend the winters in Central and South America. Um, I got a chance to be down in Arizona a couple of weeks ago, and 
mostly for baseball, but I did a little bit of recording while I was there. And we were out in the desert and saw a group of about 80 vultures that were all circling on a particularly windy day. And it was still kind of warm. Um, and they were all looking for thermals and kind of getting themselves organized and, and they're and they end up making their way northward. And, you know, um, in, a, in a season where the population is large, we may have somewhere in the range of 800,000 to a million vultures moving from from Central America into into Puerto Rico. Okay. And so they're here throughout the summer, but you know as summer starts to wind down, we have toward fall, and vultures and a lot of other birds that are here for the summer start to look for uh, opportunities to move from southward and find uh, better habitat and, and better climate. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Tom, and he's going to talk about the second half of the calendar year, what you can see during the fall of winter. Thank you.
uh, feeding off the thistle. This probably is a female, although it could be a male that's uh, lost its uh, mating plumage. Okay, many small birds like uh, bush tits, uh, lark sparrows, chickadees, and soft and chicken sparrows are in the in the fall. They kind of tend to flock together, and there's primary reason for flocking together when you're looking for food is for protection more than anything else. So what these birds will do will post sentries that will sound alarms when predators are coming or at rest. Actually, the mouth of the chickadee and the white bridge of nuthatch uh, will recognize each other's alarm call. Uh, I'm going to have more to say about these a little later. These are sandhill cranes. Who knows what sandhill cranes are? Oh, great. You, have you seen any or heard any yet this spring? They, they, they're coming through. I've seen uh, two flocks, uh, and I heard them first. I heard them first, and I looked up and I looked. The, the sound that they make is so incredibly distinctive. They're amazing birds. Here's another amazing bird, the Swainson's Hawk. It's, a, uh, it's one of the booty of one of the broad wing, uh, broad tails, uh, hawk. Like the red tail hawk, you know, the red tail hawk. I don't know, you may not have seen this one. This, this claim to fame of this uh, bird is that it's kind of migration that uh, extends all the way from the, uh, from Canada down to Argentina. If, if you go from the northern tip of its range down to the southern tip in Argentina, you're talking about 10 or 11,000 miles to that thing will migrate. It'll take like a couple months to make, make it all the way from the north down to the south a couple months back so it spends at least four months plus out of the year just flying from one place to the other. These are, uh, let's see, these, they have smaller feet and smaller feet than say the red tail hawk for example. So the, the prey that they take is smaller. These uh, birds feed off the grasshoppers, believe it or not. And during the summertime, you can see them following uh, farmers that are pulling equipment. And as, as the equipment's being pulled through the fields, it stirs the ground up, and the grasshoppers are up, and they're right there to take them. So grasshoppers are a big staple for this hog. And like I said, the primary reason I think is because their beaks and their talons are smaller than the other uh, I, I, this is an amazing bird. It's well worth trying to see it. Okay, here, um, here we have birds that migrate long distances. Um, barn swallows, which I'm sure you see. Um, they migrate in flocks. They don't migrate up to like three to six thousand miles. So a lot of their long travelers. And this, this, uh, the Rufus hummingbird is, is really amazing. It, uh, it's only about three inches long, so it's not very big. It's very aggressive. Uh, it, uh, it'll drive the other uh, hummingbirds away from the feeders. You know, we see these every fall, but we don't see them in the spring. And the reason for that is that they don't nest as far north as Alaska. And, they come as far south as, uh, as Mexico, so we're talking, you know, a maximum of 4,000 miles if these things are migrating. Think about that. It's a bird that's only about three inches long, and it travels 4,000 miles. The migration pattern of these things are uh, really interesting, too. You see, you see them in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the fall, because when they migrate from the north down to Mexico, they come down the Rocky Mountains. But in the spring, when they go back up north, they migrate along the uh, Pacific coast. So they've got a, a different pattern coming down than they have going up. So that's why you see them in the fall, but not in the spring. Warblers, uh, lots of different kinds of warblers. Not so many here. When I was when I was a boy, I used to go out with my dad and look, uh, look for warblers uh, in Minnesota which is in the Mississippi Flyway. There's four major flyways in the country, and that's as far as the is concerned. 
so that's that's that has the most different kinds of birds. We would see like uh, between thirty and forty different warblers in one morning. Pretty amazing. Partial migrators. Uh, eagles are. Let's talk about eagles first. There's a resident population of eagles that, that are here. Uh, when they when they're young, are fledged. You know, they hang around for a while. Basically, they move south. And other young from eagles further north come here. So we have a, we have a population of eagles in the winter that's a lot bigger than it is in the summer. The, uh, the resident eagles seem to tolerate these uh, juveniles who come from the north, uh, but not so they're in the so this is a good time of year to see eagles, gold eagles as well. Bald gold eagles, there's lots and lots of them. If you put for any effort at all, uh, you're going to see lots of them. Uh, the robin, robin, we talked about the robin a little earlier. Robins are another interesting bird. You see robins all year round, but you don't necessarily see the same robins all year round. That makes sense. So we have a resident population, some but not all migrate south, and then others come in from the north. So, like I said, you don't necessarily see the same uh, robins uh, all year round. Even though you see robins, it's not necessarily the same group. Red tails, uh, you see those all year round too. And same thing, you've got, you've got red tails coming in from the north. Uh, like, like the same, same, as, same thing as with the eagles. Okay, the hummingbirds. I already talked about the, the rufus. What an amazing bird that is. Like I said, it's only three inches long. Think about how far it travels. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's incredible that these little birds can fly that far and be safe, safe enough so that they'll survive, so that the species is what it is. Well, two of them are uh, the American Dipper. Has anybody seen the American Dipper? Okay, you can see these downtown Boulder, along Boulder Street, and during the winter. So these things, uh, along with the uh, Junko and the uh, Solitaire, are higher up during the summer. But yet, during the winter time, they come down elevation. You see, we've got lots and lots of Junkos in our bird feeders right now, as I'm sure. Those of you that have bird feeders out see lots of numbers, but not so many. We keep our bird feeders up all year round, not so many in the summertime because they go back up the hill. Does it stop by itself? Okay, let's talk about the craze for a second. Like I said, these are. Magnificent birds. They're about four, four and a half feet tall, something like that. Wingspan of about six plus feet. They're big birds. And they're ancient birds. Uh, there's fossilized records of these things going back by like about two and a half million years. And if you look at those fossils, they pretty much look just like the sand hills look today. If you look at the uh, range uh, of these birds, Look at all of Canada, all of Canada, and all of the northern United States. And during the uh, during the fall, they keep in mind how what what a broad expanse that is. They all kind of funnel together, come through Kearney, Nebraska. So if you ever want to see several hundred thousand cranes at once, go to Kearney, uh, Nebraska. Due to the fall or spring, check uh, check the web page, you know, check Carney, you can find out when is a good time to go. My wife and I have been up there a couple times. Well, it's just an amazing sight. You can't imagine seeing several hundred thousand of these things at once. And that's what you can see when you go up there and look. Okay, with our great blue herons, uh, uh, well, I talked about those a little bit already. They're kind of interesting because uh, 
some of them migrate, but yet some of them have found that there's enough open water and there's enough food so that they don't migrate, they just stay. But a lot of migrate. And the uh, Arab groups talk a little bit about those groups. I can think of three diggers that we have here in uh, Boulder County. And that's, that's amazing to see these big birds up in the cottonwood trees in these big nests. Pintails. Uh, Pintails easily identifiable by the, uh, by the tail. They, they don't stay, they pass on through. And actually, they migrate to really far north. And actually, some of them actually will cross the Bering Straits and go over into Siberia. So these have a big, uh, these, are, these are pretty amazing birds as well. Uh, when, I was, when I was working, I used to work uh, for the Forest Service. And the Klamath River uh, wildlife refuge in Oregon, I would see uh, lots of these things, and I don't have any way of estimating numbers, but there are tens of thousands of these things in, in flocks. Just amazing, amazing sight. These are some of the more common uh, birds that you see. Um, you know, the uh, bird answers, the red heads, and green heads. I, you know, I, I found out a long time ago that if you're really serious about looking at ducks, you really should uh, get a scope. And the uh, binoculars are fine, and you can definitely see things with binoculars, but if you really want to identify ducks, a uh, scope is what, what you need. Uh, the widgets and coots, they have kind of an interesting relationship. The uh, widget is a dauber, which means uh, it sits on the top of the water and it tips down and with its butt sticking out. It doesn't die. Whereas the coot, which is not a duck, it's actually uh, closer to uh, rails, if you know what those are, uh, will go down and pick, uh, pick up vegetation from the bottom and bring it up and share it with the, uh, with the widget. Uh, shovelers. Uh, there's an article in the uh, camera just what you see me on see uh, just a week or something like that ago. And these things are going crazy, going around in circles and the water and why were they doing that? They're trying to stir up uh, invertebrates. So they, their uh, their meat is specialized so that they can uh, string out and invertebrates and, and feed off of that way. So they have that particular kind of uh, uh, peculiar type of behavior. And uh, shovelers also, this being a good time to talk about uh, molting. You know, some uh, some ducks, uh, or all ducks, all ducks molt. Here's the, you see the male right here. You see the colorful plumage? And here's the male a little later in the summer. But the, the males, when they molt, they drop all their feathers and they're, they can't fly. So at, after after they have their young, the, uh, the males will molt and look like this, something like the females. But then they'll molt right back again before they take off in the fall. So they're not in this state very long. So they're, they have this colorful uh, plumage in the winter so that uh, they'll attract females during the winter so when they show up, uh, the mate, they've already, they're already for business. So the males bolt in quick succession from this color to this color to back to this color. Winter, winter uh, in Boulder County is, is uh, not all that severe, but it can be. And of course, the further north you go, know, the more uh, the more drastic the winter is. So it can be. I think this is a beautiful picture. Okay, where as, as the seasons change, uh, birds that here, that stay here, are facing a lot of challenges. You know, birds in the winter time, or before winter, fall, they can either leave to go to warmer climates, to better food, for food period, or they can, they can cover it out. And there's a fair number of birds that actually cover it out, like this uh, poor little jungle right here. See this picture right here. 
these would offer cover protection from the elements, the wind, and in case of the winter, the snow and the cold temperatures, and also it protects them more from predators that are not as visible. Uh, the jungle. See how fluffed up the feathers are? And the chickadee, see how fluffed up the feathers? It's kind of like a like a down coat. It, it, uh, it, it offers uh, protection against the uh, the elements. Actually, uh, birds are better at holding up in the winter than the uh, mammals are. And the jungle uh, has, has uh, an extra layer of fat that helps people walk as well. Okay, the, the chicken sparrow. Uh, if you have a bird feeder, see these. Uh, you know, they're, they're here now. And the robin, we talked about the robin with them already. And the, uh, and the geese. The geese, uh, you see a lot more geese during the winter time than you do in the summer. Why is that? Well, that's because, uh, again, if you look at the range, the you know, migration, uh, not the, the distribution of, uh, of geese, it's throughout all North America, practically, right? Canada, uh, the United States. During the northern, if you look at the northern range of, uh, of the geese, those are the ones that really migrate from the south. Here you've got the uh, geese were, that are here all year round that don't migrate. So that's why you see so much more geese in the winter time than in the wood you would in the, in the summer time. Uh, habitat. So what happens in, in uh, when when there's no habitat or poor habitat? Well, like I said, they're more more vulnerable to predation, and they're uh, they're more vulnerable to the elements, you know, the wind, the snow. Uh, so any any kind of cover that you can provide them, like bird houses, for example, that that will be to their uh, to their benefit. Food. There's a scarcity of food in wintertime, of course, but there is food. The white crown sparrow, how many of you see white crown sparrows? Anybody? Okay, well, I always look at the white crown sparrows because every once in a while you see one with a little white patch right underneath its uh, beak. Those are the white throated sparrows. They look exactly like the white crown sparrows, but uh, I say, uh, what, not even one in a hundred. Are, uh, are the uh, white building. But you see these all feeding on sea. And here is a feeder with, uh, with what, fishes? Looks like they're mostly uh, purple fishes feeding on sea that we have provided. And here you see a, uh, probably a down and This is a, a, a hole to pursue it. And you can just Tell that it's probably down because it's the uh, hair would be a lot longer than the, than the sewer hole. All different kinds of food. Seed is one source, uh, nuts, uh, one source, uh, grain in the fields, uh, black birds feed off the grain in the fields. And fruit, right? Fruit, you know, like uh, uh, crab apple trees or. Uh, uh, and we have a sawgrass berry bush in our front yard. There's dried fruit, and robins especially go after the dried fruit. Vegetarians, you know, magpies, uh, quills, raisins, feed off the carrion. So it tastes to be opportunistic, and they are. Water, there's a shortage of water in winter, uh, but the birds seem to find it. Uh, open, uh, there's open water in creeks a lot. Uh, bird bass, you need bird bass, that's a good, good source of, uh, of water as well. Uh, cold temperatures. What happens in cold, really cold temperatures? Well, it really gets cold. Well, birds can go into kind of an involuntary, uh, what, state of, uh, Hardly being alive, it's called COPOR, P-O-R, P-O-R. It's like uh, hibernation, only in the short term. You know, their metabolism is really, 
pervasive metabolism rate is only like about you know under 10 percent of what it normally is the heart is really down the respiration is down they're just barely alive and that's how they can survive the, uh, the, the extreme cold and was the was fucking the feathers up as well they don't seem to be ever told but they come out of it right away i mean it could be just like overnight for a few days but it's really cold in the same period of time so it's not it's like a short-term hibernation, I guess, is what you call it. And you see the chickens over there with the feathers plucked out. And another problem, particularly in the winter, because there's a lot less cover, is predation. You know, foxes and bobcats and birds uh, the type of falcon. So the more vulnerable to being uh, caught by uh, predators during this time of year. Uh, bees, we've got a shark shed in the last, we live in northern town, the north of Boulder, and we've got a shark shed that hangs around our bird feeder. And guess what that thing does? It takes other birds. It takes other birds. But it, it, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a magnificent bird, about the size of a crow or something like that. But, it's it's uh it's amazing. Cooper's hawk looks a lot like it on me, it's a lot it's larger. The ptarmigan. You know about the ptarmigan? Here's the uh, here's what it looks like in the summer. It's got this mottled uh, effect, got feathers that uh, give it a mottled appearance so it'll blend in with the uh, with the surroundings. Well then in the wintertime, the plumage changes to this because it's snow. But there's one problem about uh, the power of changing its plumage, its coloration. It seems that the uh, photo period, the length of day and night, is what triggers these things to change color. So with a lot less snow, or snow coming later, these things would get caught uh, as being white when there's no snow or very little snow. Bird feeders are a good way to watch uh, and see birds while looking uh, at them in the cover of your home. Uh, uh, we have probably, oh, I'd say about 10 feeders out back, which is a little over a thousand. But I like white bunch birds. And you, you see amazing birds. I mean, you see, uh, you see the usual things, uh, but then every once in a while you see something different, like the red bull. See the red pole right here? It doesn't look like much, but it really is. It, uh, it uh, lives way north, and when it comes south, it doesn't normally come as far south as this. It's where we are. But one winter, about know, five years ago or something like that, I don't remember exactly when. So lots of these, lots of these. I had a, we had about a dozen of them there feeder for like a month and a half. And I don't know what cost them to come. They just, uh, Lack of food or temperature, I'm not sure what. But I haven't seen one since. And that one sound, one winter, we saw lots and lots of them. So you never know what you can see. I mean, uh, like uh, the, the, the uh, Zuli bunting, you see those that are big, but just for a few days. And you don't want to see those. So you can see birds that you wouldn't normally see otherwise. So it pays to put a fear on. I think. Or you can go outside. This is a great time of year, and it's starting to get a later and later. But the winter time is a great time to see hawks. Uh, it is. Uh, there's, there's, uh, see the rough legged hawk up here? And the fruitiness hawk right here? You see those in the winter time. You don't see those in the summer time. No, no, the fruitiness uh, hawk. See the uh, see the talons right there, the feet, feathers covering their uh, covering their feet, and the uh, rough-legged hawk also has feathers covering their talons. That's the only broad-tailed hawk and broad-winged hawk that has feathers that go all the way down to the ankle. So if you see a bird, if you're close enough, or you get a good look at it, this time of year. If you see feathers on the feet, you know that it's either a 
moodiness or a uh, wet light. The virgin is the large bird. It's the largest of the uh, buddhas. Bigger than that I mean, it's, it's a big bird. It, uh, it's not quite the size of an eagle, but it's really big. And the wet legged is, is interesting because it nests really far north in the Arctic. And you don't see these two in the, in the, uh, in the winter. And the red tails. Those are three common hawks you see. And eagles. Lots and lots of golden eagles and lots of bald eagles. Uh, again, uh, off our deck. I mean, this is right practically in town. Off our deck, about 50 feet off of, uh, our deck in uh, an ash tree. There's a golden eagle stay for about two hours. It's huge. Can't believe how big those things are. And lots of lots of feeders, and there was not one squirrel on sight. They were gone. Uh, these are other birds that we'll see in the uh, in the winter. Uh, American tree sparrow looks like the chicken sparrow, except he's got a spot right in the middle of the chest. The Bohemian waxwing looks like the cedar waxwing. Except it's bigger and it's kind of more, more gray in color. And the shrike, which is uh, uh, this is a printer, not the bird, that's all the you know, leaves. So anyway, you see these in the wintertime. And this is the last slide. This is why it pays to stop and look at uh, the ponds as you're driving by or as you're walking by. You see the, uh, the uh, Canada geese, and you see the mallards, and you see these swans. This this is an unusual sight, thunder swan. So, like I said, it always pays to stop and look because you never know what you're going to see. And I think that was the last slide. Where was that taken, sir? Where was that photo? Where was it taken? Walden Pond, right near the county. Walden Pond. Is it look, almost look like Macintosh? Yeah, that one was Walden Pond. Thank you. Oh, I forgot that. I forgot. This is another one of my favorite birds. This thing is about two feet long. It's about two feet long and has a wingspan of about four, four and a half feet. And it's right at the top of the food chain. It, I, there's a picture. Uh, what one was that? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, yes. Sunday night. Sunday night. We were watching the, the, the webcam. The webcam for the Osprey. Then Owl came up. Great Horn Owl came by. And just blasted the uh, the Osprey right off the nest. <gasps> they were right off the nest. These things are very, uh, very aggressive. Birds. She's not sitting in the nest yet. She was just standing so there. Out. Out. And, and it's, if you go look at the webcam, it's, there's a little clip on it that shows it. And it just it's at night, and it just this owl just has. Well, and she goes off. She's okay. She came back. Okay. Also on, uh, on what uh, what's it called? YouTube. Uh, there's a there's a there's a a, 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 a series of uh, shots that show uh, the, uh, the great horn owl taking out uh, a red tail. It was on a nest. Took out the took out both the parents and the young. Took them, them all out, and they're not much bigger. Huh. Okay, well, we're going to end this uh, with the time, and what we're going to do is give yourself a, a minute, couple of minutes where to ask questions. If you have questions, uh, if you want to know where things can be found, you can stay later and ask us. We'll tell you what we know. Um, but uh, this is a, a program that the county likes to get people interested in birding and we hope that you'll get out there and and enjoy that um, if you want us a prime spot to go see those um, the great uh, blue herons in their nest um, boat Bella crossing which is now open thank you very much um, and and, and, we, and um, we said that you could go back to the back side on the west side you're on the back side of the rookery that you get from Crane Hollow. Yeah. So you can go down Crane Hollow off of St. Crane Road, and there are dozens of them nesting now. 
and give them a few more weeks and then recline in and out to feed their very hungry, very hungry barking children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So questions? Question. Um, when can you or how do you go see the eagles climb into the roof area, that's what it's called, over by sandstone? Isn't there a thing they do in the there, there, there are. There, the question was, can you go see the the um, where the eagles fly into the roosts over by uh, sandstone along Boulder Creek? Um, I'm not sure there's a spot you could actually watch them come into that area. Um, the best spot right now to see the, the bald eagles is the hygiene nest on Hygiene Road, uh, just south of uh, Highway 36, you come down the hill, and there's a pool out there on the north side, and you'll see a couple of large cottonwood trees. Now, they're back in the field, but in there is one very large eagle's nest, and they are sitting that nest now Where is that? Uh, on Hygiene Road. So between about <laughs> County Road 59 and and headed toward 30, headed west toward 36, um, on the north side of the road. So they're sitting that pull on the pull up, but just recognize that they're going to be back. Probably one of them is going to be in that nest, and it's hard to see unless you have an immediate binoculars or a scope. But sometimes they'll be flying in and out of those trees a little bit later in the season when they're feeding. And they're bringing in food. As far as bald eagles go, I've had pretty good luck at Waterman. Um, you just go to the, you know, where the shelter is. They won't necessarily be real close, but there are a number of trees around. I've seen up to 10 just standing one place and looking through 60. The other place that I would suggest, it's not in Boulder County, but Bar Lake State Park is a wonderful place to go see because if you're willing to take a bit of a hike. And you can go out to St. Brain State Park. Last weekend there were 15 immature bald eagles at St. Brain State Park, which is just this side of I-25. So the, the immatures are starting to go back north as um, we talked about migration. Yeah. Uh, and but the, um, the in the winter you get a lot of them and Loggerman anywhere out in that area is great to see, particularly the immature bald eagles. Uh, right now the adults who are permanent residents are starting to, are on the nests. One thing about the Loggerman, uh, if you have a scope. You're guaranteed to see the eagle in Austria right now. Uh, the eagle on the uh, south side of the, <coughs> the, the uh, Osprey is more west. And also, which I think is really interesting, uh, oh, also what I think is interesting is uh, the northern area of Marsh Park on the western side of Logan. I've been there, what, six or seven times this past winter. Every time I've been there, I've seen the Marsh Park. It's uh, either it's not not the male; it's either a female or a juvenile. But every time I've seen it, and that's I haven't seen it anywhere else at this time of year. So, good uh, I'm from Florida, so I'm trying to learn what birds are out here and stuff. Um, at How Valley Ranch, you had mentioned that there's wild turkeys. Is there only one type of turkey here? Is it only one type of goose and one type of vulture here? Um, yes, there's only one type of wild turkey. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one type of wild turkey. Uh, we only get the vultures in the summer. Uh, they don't winter here. It's too cold. They need the thermals. Um, so just turkey vultures. So the tur I'm sorry, turkey vultures. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We just get yes. It was right. We just get the turkey vultures. We don't get the black vultures you get in Florida. Okay. They don't come this far north. And our turkey vultures are only here in the summer. And you don't have like the uh, the bronze. Uh, or the, no. or the, uh, the West, uh, the bronze, are they also look turkeys? No. Okay. The turkeys. She was asking yeah. about different types of turkeys. Uh, and for those of you who can't hear the questions back there, it was, do we get other than just the, the wild common turkey? The answer is no. What do we do with our vultures? We only get the turkey vultures. We only get them in the summer. The black vultures are further south, not here. And just Canadian geese? Here. We get Canada geese, we get gad cackling geese, and sometimes we'll get um, white fronted. We've had greater white fronted snow yes. geese and snow, snow. geese. Snow. We had yeah. brant. 
We don't get a lot of snow geese yet. Not a lot of snow geese, no. Not like you get further east. This young gentleman's got a question. Yes. What's, the, what's the best place to see golden eagles? What's the best time? Place. Uh, place. 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 Okay. Goldens are a little tough. Um, right now, they, they nest up at both um, Rabbit Mountain, but then they're back in an area that you can't access. Um, I think they're back nesting in the park in Lyons. So the park that's right there at the confluence of the rivers of the St. Brain, North Fork, and the South Fork. Uh, what's the name of that park? Confluence Park, I think. What is it? I think it's Confluence Park. Confluence Park. That may be what it's called. Um, yeah, they're a bit more secretive, so it's hard to predict that they'll be in a certain the spot. Uh, have you been to Rabbit Mountain? Who knows where Rabbit Mountain is? Okay, if, if you're in the parking lot and you look to the north, you see that big face cliff? Look for whitewash. There's, they're always there. I've never failed to see them every time I went up there. So that's a sure fire way of, uh, of seeing goats. They're always there. And at Confluence Park, if you go in and look up in those cliffs and look for the, the nest, you should be able to see some whitewashing and some nest. If they're, and I, I think they're back there this year, but I'm not, I can't guarantee it. I haven't seen it. Yes, ma'am. Is there a website where somebody posts what a rec where a recent sighting was, or was that caused like a rush on some place? Yeah. Uh, and it had occurred. Like, yeah. There are. And maybe we could talk about that after. Okay. I, I'll give you some. Okay. I've got a sheet that I can. Give there are places. There are postings and and places you can use uh, apps and sources. What you will not generally find is people will generally not post the location of nesting birds okay. for just the reason you're concerned about that. Too many people then show up and, and, is, and don't recognize that that's a disturbance for the bird and the, and the nest may fail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He says close it off. Any other questions and then we'll, we'll close it down. Thank you so much for coming.